All right, so over the last few weeks, we've been checking in with some of our potential Olympic hopefuls and one of Ireland's main medal hopes, should the Tokyo Games go ahead, will be our two-time world champion rower and current European champion, Sunita Pishpore. And Sunita's with us now. How are you keeping, Sunita? Good, thanks. No pressure. Nice introduction there. <laughs> no pressure at all. <laughs> How's life with you at the moment? Yeah, it's all good. I mean, just finished a bit of homeschooling there with my kids, so... Delighted. Uh, we're all going through these struggles of homeschooling at the moment. Yeah. Are you good at breaking down your day that you get your own time for training and you get time for the kids as well? How's it all working? Uh, well, obviously, for me, training is priority. Uh, kids have to kind of manage on their own quite a lot now. Uh, but they're doing OK, so I'm just helping a little bit here and there. But uh, they're quite independent in general. Yeah. I was saying we've been chatting to quite a few Olympic athletes at the start of the year and everything is still so up in the air from a position it felt as 2020 was coming to an end of hope and of vaccines and of sport returning and this huge summer of 2021 to the figures we're seeing here in Ireland and around the world and states of emergency. How are you coping with the constant intake of news and ever-changing news? Um. Like, obviously, it's really upsetting to see how well we were doing after first lockdown and then the numbers going so high the last couple of weeks. So for us, I think as athletes, it's the biggest fear is to actually get that COVID because nobody knows how you're going to react to it, how much it would it take to recover. So we're doing everything possible to stay away from it. But I suppose when numbers are so high, the chances are someone's going to get it. And then, you know, that, that would be a big kind of curveball for preparation but I suppose if it happens happens one step at a time and we have a really good support team behind us to kind of help to overcome whatever if, if needs be you know uh, yeah it's and I suppose it's stressful as well with all the events we've been trying to get away on a training camp uh, somewhere slightly warmer with nicer water conditions but it hasn't worked out so far we're gonna try again maybe in February see how that goes um, yeah, hopefully we'll get to go. So, in your head, are you full steam ahead? Tokyo 2021 is happening. Are you very confident it's going to happen, that you're going to get there? Or is part of you a little bit concerned, like you were probably last March, April? Uh, I'm quite confident it's going to go ahead. Uh, it might be without much of a crowd supporting. Um, so, it might be just us athletes going there, and it's fine with me. I just want to get right. I just want to get it on, get to race Olympics, you know, and uh, yeah, it'd be kind of different not having supporting support from the crowd or the family being there, uh, although they still might travel, I don't know. Um, but I'd say it, it is going to go ahead. And in rowing, we also had European Championships where we tested, uh, let's say, the, all the protocols around COVID, how to stay safe and stuff. So I think all that that we tried out is going to help us as well and keep us a little bit kind of calmer, I suppose, mm. for anyone. The way you're talking, there, there's an acceptance that if it does go ahead, that it is going to be a very different type of Olympic Games from your previous experience in terms of Athletes Village. And I guess in previous experiences, you could go and while you may not get the medal and there's the disappointment of that, there's also a real sense of achievement of being there and the enjoyment of being around the, athlete, uh, the Athletes Village and seeing all those other competitors being part of Team Ireland and, and part of that sort of family, that, that maybe this time it's going to be a, a little bit more of a, a lonely experience where it's more just focused on getting there, getting the job done and getting back home safely. Yeah, definitely getting the job done and getting home safely. <laughs> I think uh, I did. I was lucky enough that I got to go to Olympics already. So like the first Olympics was absolutely magical. You know, being there is definitely it's kind of it's so big you don't actually realize until you get there the second olympics obviously for me was a bit of a disappointment but but again i i was there i got to go you know and uh so i don't think i'll be too upset if there's nobody there watching me racing in the last olympics i just really want to go get that racing done and uh, come home mm. it, that sounds like you're going to tokyo with totally different expectations then from previous Olympics, you're not just there for the ride, you're not just there to look around and soak it all up, that with that success at World Championships, with that success at European Championships, it is all business this time. 
Absolutely. And I mean, I didn't go like going to Rio. I had exactly the same mindset. It just didn't work out for me that well. But this time, yeah, it's, it is slightly different, I suppose, having a bit of a success behind my back kind of helps me with the mindset a little bit more, like knowing what I actually want and uh, making sure, like getting everything done now in preparation to make sure that that everything kind of works out in my favor, you know. Um, yeah. What's the main lesson you learned from Rio? Uh, not to freak out. <laughs> Well, uh, for me, I think the biggest curveball I got was that unfortunate quarterfinal draw. Uh, if I had today's mindset, maybe I, I would have gotten through it because uh, I probably did respect my opponents too much and there were quite a big names in my quarterfinal as well. Um, couldn't quite handle the pressure, I'd say. And has that been a natural evolution because of the success you've had over the last few years that naturally that's going to bring its own level of confidence? Or have you had to talk to a lot of people about Rio to make sure that actually next time around you were in a very different state of mind? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. Like disappointment in Rio kind of, it, it kind of gets some fear into you. It might happen again. So, and uh, with all the hard work, we're trying to make sure it never happens, you know. Um, so I think definitely a bit of a both parts play, plays quite a big role in not kind of mm. what I was ahead anyway. Yeah, uh, I know from uh, seeing previous interviews that you've done, uh, the age question comes up quite a lot and it's not something you particularly want to dwell on or talk about. But when we are talking about Olympics and them being pushed back a year and we still don't know what's going to happen this year, it, and uh, so recently you were saying that maybe Tokyo might be the end, but you didn't want to commit to anything at this stage. Like, in terms of the age, are, are you thinking, well, whether Tokyo happens or not, I have another Olympics in me? Uh, another Olympics would be a bit of a stretch. I don't know. I wouldn't think that far ahead now. I just want to get this Olympics done first and then see if I want to do another year. And then who knows? Because the next cycle is only three years long. So uh, it's very short suppose but uh we'll see we'll see not saying no we're not saying yes so. yeah uh, it, it is a sport though that actually lends itself to the more experienced the better is it the belarusian rower uh karsten who uh, went to the last olympics at 40 44 yeah and she beat me like <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah definitely experience plays a big role and i think that's that's how she beat me with the experience she had over the years because um, she absolutely blasted out of the blocks and I couldn't see her for the whole race. Mm. Uh, she was one of my targets to beat, but it didn't happen. Um, yeah, but talking about the age as well, you know, the last 10 years have flown by so fast that I, I don't think it's even fair that I'm already here, like, on 39, you know. It just doesn't feel like it at all. Yeah. Has it crossed your mind then of what happens if it doesn't go ahead? as to how you would how you would deal with that considering as well like i mentioned the pressure that's there come at the start of you're going there as one of ireland's main medal hopes that if somehow this can't happen as to how you sort of get your head around that well at least i like if it doesn't happen then it's unfortunate but i suppose there's bigger things in life than just going and scratching your ego you know of getting racing done at the olympics i mean if that's what it's going to take, then I suppose it would be really upsetting. But if we have to get over it, we'll get over it. Yeah, there's no shortage of perspective around, I guess, at the moment. Too. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if, if everybody needs to cancel it, that's fine. It would be less fair if, let's say, some countries couldn't go just because their numbers are like so crazy, as there was a talk about it last year, that some, some countries, if they don't get COVID under control, they might be banned. Uh, I know it's only like, a talk about it but that would be really unfair but if, if they cancel it they cancel it like but i don't think it's going to happen so yeah now. <laughs> it is interesting that conversation because i've even heard it come up again over the last few weeks that there is such a desperation that the olympics are worth so much money that they need to find some way of it happening and if that means that not every country can take part and uh, because of our privileged position generally in life in ireland we always assume that that's other countries over there Yet, when you look at the numbers, <laughs> yeah. the world leading, unfortunately, numbers in Ireland right now, uh, we can't be yeah. overly confident of anything. But from what you're saying, and I think most athletes are the same, 
if you want to go and win an Olympic medal, you want to do it against everybody. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that makes sense. No, no, nothing's coming easy is worth having. I mm. think. What's your training like at the moment? That have you been affected training-wise by this current lockdown? Because I know elite sport is allowed continue, and you are allowed continue train. But has it had any any day-to-day -day impact on you? Uh, no, we're training as per usual. We're kind of following all the guidelines and making sure we take all the precautions as well, like wearing masks and hand, hand sanitizing and everything. Uh, not staying in the premises for too long, you know, and keeping the doors open and all that. Uh, but yeah, thankfully we are able to keep training during this lo this lockdown, and it wasn't the same in spring. And I feel we could afford to kind of train at home in spring, but now this is a really important. We have only seven months left, and we have to kind of maximize all the preparation that we have we can. Mm. I would have imagined that this time last year, your run in to a twenty twenty Olympics was probably almost set in stone in sort of warm weather training and important events in the build-up. You've already spoken about having to cancel one warm weather training session. Are you being a lot more flexible in terms of your preparation this time around, knowing that things have and can change at short notice? Or have you got a sort of time frame in your mind of where you want to be along the way? Uh, there's always a bit of a time frame and there's a plan set, uh, at least on a paper. Uh, if something happens, you just kind of have to steer off the plan a little bit and do whatever's the right thing to do at that certain time. But uh, yeah, I suppose our regatta season starts in April, so we want to be kind of pretty ready to race by then. Mm. And then it's only a couple months and then we're in the last preparation for the Olympics. So it's not that long to go at all, if you look at it that way. And in terms of that peak that you want to be at the Olympics, if, if, from your experience, is that a long peak? Is that a peak that you're bringing into that regatta season that you feel can carry you through until August? Or are actually you looking at a sort of two-week spell in and around Tokyo that that's where everything is built, that that's you at your absolute peak in 2021? Yeah, we never usually peak for World Cups. Uh, we just kind of take that as part of the training. And the racing is a little bit tougher then. And once we peak for the World Championships, usually it's a very different feeling. We do... Oh, feels like a million pieces before we go over there to race. Uh, so by the time we get to race the 2K, the 2K feels like a piece of cake, you know. Like we've done so many 2Ks in training, the 1K is not, one 2K is pretty much nothing. Yeah. You no, know, it's like a rest day with a bit of effort. Um, so yeah, we're definitely going to be peaking just for, for the main event for the Olympics. And I think we start our prep for that about three weeks beforehand before we start racing. Okay. Uh, I just want to play a clip because on Sunday we had um, three uh, athletes who should be in Tokyo alongside you. We had Annalise Murphy, Kira McGean and Ellen Keane on the show and they were talking about some of the issues that face female athletes and Annalise was very interesting on some of the coaching and some of the training she went through over the years. I might just play you a clip. I'm like 185 centimetres tall and like mm. I've got a strong build. <laughs> like um, I am, um, and the optimum weight is like 68 to 72 kilos. And first of all, I couldn't understand as like a sort of 16, 17 year old, I was like, how come I don't, you know, how come I'm already heavier than the optimum weight for the laser radial? And um, I, so I was like watching what I was eating from when I was sort of 16. Um, and, but I was never too concerned about body image at that stage. And um, then it wasn't until um, I had a new coach coaching me for a while in 2009. And he was like, you have to lose weight or quit. There's no point in you sailing at this weight. And he was like, we'll have a diet competition. Now, looking back, wild. What kind of person has a diet competition with a 19-year-old oh girl? Oh, my God. Um, it was, um, and that was like, that was like the sort of the start of like where I kind of struggled with, um, with eating and like a massive amount of guilt if I'd, if I'd eaten too much, you know, like I need to go and exercise for four hours or something like that. Um, and it, um, then I was also quite lucky though, that we knew that the London Olympics were probably going to be a windy Olympics. So 
I didn't need to try and be this 72 kilo person that I had in my eye, in my mind of, you know, what weight I needed to be. Um, so there wasn't, to London, there wasn't actually huge pressure on me to be the right weight. And I ended up um, starting to work with Rory, my coach, who I'm still, he still coaches me now. And he was, you know, not like pushing me about diet and weight the entire time, which made a big difference. Yeah, that was Annalise Murphy there. She was on on Sundays off the ball alongside Ellen Keane and Kira McGean. It was a fascinating discussion, Sunita, around a range of topics that we don't talk a lot about when it comes to female sports, whether we're talking about uh, issues around body hair and a lot of talk around issues of dieting. And it, like, it's remarkable considering the success Annalise has had to hear her talk about the pressures she was put under, considering she felt she was so fit and so healthy, yet there was something there from the coach that felt she needed to lose weight. When you're listening to that, does any does any of that sound familiar? Have you have you come across those sort of pressures that are maybe put on female athletes far more than male athletes? Um, I can't say that I've been in that position myself. Um, so it's kind of yeah. I think like coaches really need to be careful, especially working with with girls, you know, and especially at a young age. You just never know what kind of impact is going to leave on a person. Uh, any small comment or something can actually do quite a lot of damage. Mm. So I think coaches definitely have to be very careful about what they say and what they, if they do have any concerns, surely they should be talking to parents instead of an athlete himself, especially at junior level. That should be illegal in general. Yeah. I feel like even weighing the athlete at the junior level should be not allowed at all. The main thing is to stay healthy and fit. That That's period. That's it. Uh, that's my opinion, but uh, sure, what do I know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, look, I guess, I guess you're at a stage as well where you've got plenty of experience and you know your body, so yeah. if a coach comes and talks to you, you know exactly the sort of shape you want to be. It is those younger, more easily influenced athletes who are worshipping their coaches and will do what they're told, and quite often they're being told the wrong thing, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you stay in, like, fine, you could be lean, this and that, but at the same time, if you're not healthy and you're getting ill a lot, there's something's off. And most of the time, it is uh, energy deficiency. Like it's, it just runs you down. You could, yeah, if you do that as a young person, you could last like a couple of years, you know, and then you will start paying after that. You will start getting ill more often. You overtraining, all that's a huge possibility. So. Yeah, I think like if there is a problem, you definitely have to involve specialists or talk to parents, not not a junior athlete. Like that's mm. what's wrong. Uh, but as as at the mature age, like I sure we all get a bit of a puppy fat over the winter, and it's fine. Like it keeps us a bit healthier. And Sharon says anyway, so <laughs> we have to do it. Yeah, yeah. Sharon's our nutritionist. Um, and I suppose we are in a sport where we do burn a lot of calories and sometimes even not eating enough can get the opposite effect. You can actually get more body fat just from not eating enough, which is funny, but it happens. Um, yeah, so also I kind of feel the social media is not sending the right message for the girls. I've seen many apps like they just pop up randomly on Instagram, like, and all you see is like, Fitness apps, fine, but why do they have to be in sports browser without a top? Like, is it really that hot all the time, or <laughs> what's happening? Like, is it really that hard to keep the shirt off or on? I mean, <laughs> yeah. But like, and there are a lot of young girls that are watching it and looking at those perfect bodies doing those setups or or squats or whatever, and they get the message they have to be exactly the same, but they don't. So yeah, it's it's a kind of touchy subject for me too because I have teenagers at home growing, you know, and. I don't want them to get so body conscious that they think they're eating too much and then start eat, not eating at all. Uh, it's a slippery slope, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I'd imagine. Is it teenage girls you have? A uh, boy and a girl. A boy and a girl. Uh, and I know with having a boy and a girl as well, albeit at a much younger age, that all the studies that are coming out more and more that are discussing the influence of social media on girls in particular from that sort yeah. of 11 plus, it is pretty worrying. It is, yeah. Like, 
and it's so accessible all the instagram and everything and yeah you can try to protect your child from it but you only can delay the time it's still they're still gonna have it you know it's such a norm these days to have instagram account or anything else that your kids would feel left out if they didn't have it mm. and then whatever they come across on the account yeah it's it's strange and a bit scary sometimes yeah, it sure is. Well, look, they've got a pretty good role model at home, which is the main thing. Are, are, are they are they are they rowing? Are they rowers? Uh, well, not yet. I don't know if there will be, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think they've seen enough of all this that I don't think they're going to sign up. For yeah, the, the pain and the suffering. Uh, well, listen, yeah, no. ho hopefully it's all worthwhile and uh, the inspiration will be there come August, September, when Tokyo, we all hope, does go ahead. And Sunita, we wish you the very best of luck. Hopefully it's plane sailing oh, between now good. and the next seven, eight months. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Bye.